Hey all welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today we get another special guest that's been on before, Mr. John Setzler of Man Cave Meals. We're going to discuss a bunch of different topics. I'll be right back with John Setzler. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from fire and water. Hey all, I want to introduce you to a company I just started working with, Fresh Jack's Organic Spices out of Jacksonville, Florida. They're a small, family-run company that's fast-growing. I've tried a bunch of their different seasoning blends and spices, and I can tell you they're all fresh, all organic. None of them contain artificial flavors or sweeteners. None of them have anti-caking agents or preservatives. They all taste like they were just made for you yesterday. Check them out, guys. They're on Amazon in the link below. They have different sample packs, different blends. Like I said, they also have the individual seasonings and spices as well. Fresh Jack's Organic Spices. Check them out, guys. I love them. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren. I'm your host. And today, we've got a guest that's been on a couple times before, but one of my favorites Probably one of your favorites, too, from uh, all the downloads he gets. Mr. John Setzler of Man Cave Meals. Welcome back, John. Uh, we're going to discuss some great topics today. Welcome back. Tell them all where you're from, who you are, and all that. Thanks, Darren. Uh, it's good to be back again. I'm John Setzler. Uh, I live up here in western North Carolina in the foothills of the mountains, and uh, I've been barbecuing and grilling uh, for quite a while now. I've been doing it on the social media front for, I think, since 2012. So it's been about eight years that I've been involved in social media, uh, barbecuing and grilling, and it's just been a blast. Yeah, I, I think I ran into you probably four or five years ago, probably about five years ago when I first started um, looking at the Kamado style grills because Kamado Guru was one of the first um, websites I actually found, and that was your uh, your baby. That's how you first started, I guess, on the social media side, was that the old uh, bulletin board type um, group that's still, still going, you know. Uh, but uh, I was searching for some information on Kamado type grills, and I found Kamado Guru, and I had a lot of information on there, and uh, started following you and then found you on Facebook and everything else. So let's talk about how you got started with the, the Kamado Guru and all that. Okay. Well, Kamado Guru came about uh, shortly after I got my first Kamado grill, which was the uh, Char Griller Acorn. And uh, a lot of people have started out with that grill. It's a, a, a steel Kamado uh, two hundred and ninety nine dollars from Lowe's, and uh, it does a very good job for what it is. It's an inexpensive way for people to get into Kamado grilling, and there weren't very many people using that grill when I first got mine. And I had actually gone to YouTube to look for some information on that grill before I bought it, and I didn't find any, and that uh, set off a few alarms that were good alarms actually that tells me you know i've got an opportunity here if i buy that grill and make some video content using that grill i'm going to be one of the first guys on youtube with it so that's what i did and then i built the forum to uh try to get more kamado users together i, I could not find a kamado forum anywhere either and to my knowledge there's still not one I haven't actually gone out and looked for another one lately, but uh, I think the KamadoGuru.com website is the only uh, dedicated uh, forum for Kamado owners out there. And uh, it, it grew fairly rapidly. I put a lot of time and a lot of work into it, making content uh, to go on that site. And uh, it does fairly well now. Uh, it's got, uh, I think, we're close to 20,000 members there. I haven't, honestly, I haven't looked at that number lately, but the, uh, the forum activity kind of slowing down a little bit. It's, uh, it, it, in this day and time, I think Facebook has, uh, 
taken the front seat in that arena, and there's not quite as much activity on the dot-com forum as there used to be. So so you're saying that um, you started growing the uh, regular website, and then Facebook kind of slowly took it over, right? It did. Uh, I decided several years after I started KamadoGuru.com to start the Kamado Guru Facebook page. And uh, even it didn't take very long with the Kamado Guru <clears throat> Facebook page for it to grow. It doesn't have as many members as the KamadoGuru.com website does, but it has a lot more active members. Uh, the number of posts per day on the uh, KamadoGuru.com website is a lot higher or a lot lower than on the Facebook page. Facebook page gets a lot more content, uh, but there is a lot of content there. You can see that Kamado Guru or that Kamado cooking and discussion forum there has 231,000 posts in it. So yeah, it's, there's, there's a vast amount of knowledge on that site. Most of my site traffic on that site lands people there through Google searches and, uh, that's just uh, how that site works these days. But the number of new posts on that site every day is is m not very much compared to the the Facebook group. Yeah, um, but still, you're going to get a lot of traffic. And like you said, there's a lot of content on there that you can't pull over from Facebook. So um, it's always a good resource for people. Um, you know, thirty six thousand. Like you said, you started with the Acorn. And that was one of the things when I first uh, found you is um, I, it, that's what made me buy my acorn because that's exactly what I did. I bought my acorn because I saw several people on the Kamado Guru say what you should do is buy something cheaper to see if you like this style of cooking before you make that type of investment. And that's the type of person I am. I don't want to go out and spend a thousand dollars on something and not know if I'm going to like that type of cooker. So the uh, Two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollar range that the Acorn is in fit fit the uh, you know wallet you know that I you know needed to be able to budget to talk the wife into, and then you know gave me the opportunity to try out that type of cooking. Not to saying that an Acorn is exactly like a Kamado Joe or a Big Green Egg, but it's very similar and it's a similar type of cooker. Exactly the uh, the Acorn when I bought that Acorn. I had saved up the money to buy a big green egg and I was planning to go the very next week to a friend of mine's shop and buy the big green egg. Uh, I, I had not seen the acorn and I didn't know anything about it. But when I stumbled across it, I said, I'm willing to throw $300 at that to see if it's uh, usable or not. And then if I don't like it, I'll go back and buy the big green egg. Well, I put it through its paces. I, I cooked on it pretty hard for six or seven months. And still decided, even after that, that I still wanted a ceramic cooker. But during that time and the uh, advent of KamadoGuru.com, I learned that the Big Green Egg wasn't the only player in that game. And that's mainly why I ended up with something else and went with Kamado Joe instead. Now, before you um, got that acorn, did you do any kind of social media at all? I mean, you didn't start any you know, YouTube videos or anything like that until you got that cooker. Is that correct? No, uh, I had done some videos on YouTube prior to getting the acorn. Uh, the acorn was not my first videos. I had done some uh, video content on a Weber kettle and on my Weber Smoky Mountain before I got the acorn. Uh, but I didn't have much of a following until I got the acorn. The acorns what uh, made my subscriber count go way up and go way up quickly. Now, did your excitement about cooking, you know, and, and starting that, uh, you doing more content go up when you got the acorn and Absolutely. then when you got the Kamado Joe? Absolutely. The acorn, once, once uh, I started getting a lot of followers up uh, and at this time, when I say a lot of followers, I'm talking about maybe 4,000 or 5,000 followers on YouTube. It started to get fairly exciting. I was uh, also following some of the other barbecue guys like uh, Troy, for instance, uh, Greg Mervich, 
uh, Alan Johnson out in California and a couple other people, uh, we kind of ran together. We had a little group. Uh, we supported each other and we were all growing our channels. But uh, things started to change dramatically when I started getting emails from people saying, hey, can I send you my product to try out and use on your channel? That, that, uh, that get, that's when things start to really get exciting, as you already know. So when did you um, start really getting involved with Kamado Joe? Because um, it, that's another thing, you know, not too long after I discovered Kamado Guru, um, I saw that you had hooked up with Kamado Joe and started doing some of their videos for their YouTube channel and Facebook and all that. Right. I hooked up with Kamado Joe in 2013, uh, late, late in the year in 2013. Um, that was at the point where I had decided I still wanted a ceramic Kamado and I was not going to, uh, continue, uh, with the, uh, acorn. And like I said, as my channel was growing and people were giving me equipment to use on my channel in exchange for, you know, just giving them a, a shout out, uh, I decided I was going to ask Kamado Joe if they would like to provide me with a grill. And they did, and that's how that got started. Uh, at first, I was just doing the Kamado Joe. I was using the Kamado Joe on the Man Cave Meals channel, just using it. You know, I, of course, did a walk around demo and a review of the product when I got it. And uh, I was just doing my general cooking with it. And that apparently had a big enough impact with Kamado Joe at that time that they uh, decided they would like for me to produce content exclusively for them. And it wasn't very long after that, that we came to an agreement to make that happen. And we temporarily shut down, or we shut down the Man Cave Meals uh, Facebook, or we shut down the Man Cave Meals YouTube channel uh, during a good bit of that time until we recently opened it back up. It's been two or three years ago that I brought Man Cave Meals back, but I still agree to exclusively cook on Kamado Joe grills, Kamado Joe Kamados, you know, I, I, I still have an agreement with them that I will not use a different Kamado grill. And I, I wouldn't want to use a different Kamado grill, to be honest with you. There's nothing else out there that I'd really rather cook on. Hey, all I want to welcome again, Inkbird is our sponsor for the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird has more than just barbecue thermometers and instant read thermometers that I've talked about before. Inkbird just came out with a Wi-Fi sous vide circulator that I've been using for a few weeks now that works pretty good. It has over 1,000 watts of power. It has an app that has many times and temps for meats and vegetables. It also has onboard times and temps for meats and vegetables. It runs really quiet. Fits most regular sous vide containers that are the size of the Anovas. So check it out. Look below, there's a link with a code for 30% off of the Amazon price that makes it under $60 right now until June 5th. So check out the Inkbird Wi Fi sous vide circulator in the description below. Back to our program. All right, so we had a little technical issue there and then uh, we think we got that fixed. So, so you had an exclusive with uh, Kamado Joe for a while, then they allowed you to start going back to your man cave meals and doing other grills, but they were exclusive on, on the ceramic side. So that gave you the chance to reopen the, the man cave meals website or the YouTube channel. And now you have the Facebook group and or Facebook page for man cave meals and the Facebook group as well. So, so it sounds like, that was great to get you really a good boost in audience, correct? Well, it did. And I've got no problem with, uh, you know, cooking exclusively on the Kamado Joe, a uh, Kamado. Uh, even if I did not have this partnership with Kamado Joe, I'd still be cooking on that Kamado. I don't think there's anything uh, else that I would want to cook on. And even if Kamado Joe booted me out the door today, I'd still be cooking on the Kamado Joe grill. I just, I love that grill. And uh, I'm not using that grill just because it's been provided to me. I would buy that grill if that's what it took. So 
Yeah, it gives me the opportunity to cook on some other equipment. Like, as you know, I've got the wood-fired pizza oven. I've got the Karuba Q. Uh, Masterbuilt now has also, since they own Kamado Joe, has given me the opportunity to uh, cook on their new Gravity Series smokers, which has been, been pretty nice. I've been cooking on a PK grill. My association with uh, Atlanta Grill Company is allowing me to explore a lot of different equipment these days. Yeah, I'm just kind of showing people the um, Man Cave Meals Facebook page and your YouTube channel, and um, they'll be able to see once they see the videos how how they kind of they're they kind of stop there for a while and then start coming back. But I agree with you 100 percent on the uh, Kamado Joe. Uh, like I said, you know the Kamado Guru and and you are one of my first. Um, exposures to Kamado grills and I, I'm one that looks at things 150 different ways before I buy something and, right and I, I make sure that it has what I want and what I need and I, I'm I don't get too caught up in just brand name you know it's got to the brand's got to make sense to me it's got to have everything I want and need and the quality's got to be there and Kamado Joe you know I, I went and bought you know the the big Joe was my first Kamado Joe and I paid 1200 bucks for it at Costco. So, I mean, I sunk a, a big chunk of change into it and I love that grill. And, um, before I even started doing this and one of the things that really I loved about it was the versatility of what it could do. And, but it, it re really recaptured my, uh, got me going back on, um, cooking outside again. Cause I had on and off cooked outside done smoking. I always loved to cook, but I really hadn't done a whole lot of outdoor cooking until I got the big Joe and really started expanding, you know, into the outdoor cooking. Uh, you know, my whole desire was to get everything out on the, on the grill. And to me, you know, that's the fun of it. And that's kind of what you do. You show so many different ways to cook things outdoors. And now, not just on the Kamado Joe, but now that you use the pellet grill, you use the wood fired oven, you show people multiple ways to cook outdoors. And I'm glad that you still are representing Kamado Joe to some extent, but now you have the ability to expand that uh, with other products and other, uh, you know, especially working with Atlanta Grill Company, which is another great company. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, I love the content you've always done. I mean, I think people really appreciate the different things that not just complicated things you know there's a lot of different guys out there they try to see how complicated they can get things you know and uh, how fancy they can make them but you do a lot of simple stuff to show people you can be you know creative with with just simple ingredients and that's what i love about it yeah exactly i i have an appreciation for all the complicated food uh and as you know i don't spend a whole lot of time with that and unfortunately, I probably should spend more time working on plating and at least making it look nice. But um, I don't like a lot of the cookbooks that I've come across in the past uh, because the pictures in these cookbooks are amazing. The recipes are amazing. But they're, when you really get down to looking at those things, uh, they're a lot more complicated than the average cook is going to do in his backyard. The, uh, the Weber cookbooks, I think, are the biggest offender of that in my, in my mind from the books I've looked at. And I, I get feedback from people, especially when I do something that is on the complicated side. But some of the complicated stuff I've done, I think one of the most complicated cooks I've ever done on a Kamado would have been the beef Wellington uh, several years ago before Christmas. But I was blown away by how many people came back to me after that and said, showed me pictures of the beef Wellington they had made. And most of them looked better than mine. And uh, people were just blown away by how good that is and how it's not quite as difficult as people make it out to be. But yeah, I like cooking simple stuff. I like just anything that'll get somebody to try something on their grill that they might not have considered doing on the grill before. Definitely. And I see, uh, we talked about this before, um, 
more and more people getting out on their uh, in their backyards and on their patios cooking, especially with all these new type of smokers that have been out that are coming out and that keep keep coming out. All this innovation that keeps coming out with these new smokers. And we talked, you just talked about it with the Karuba Q and uh, the master built gravity fed series. That's, that's a real hot one right now that, you know, that gravity series, because, you know, the pellet grills have been growing for the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years. You know, they've been getting more and more technical with the Wi-Fi and, and everything. But, um, you know, here comes master built with this charcoal uh, based, Wi-Fi type unit, first of its kind, and that's blowing people away. And I know you've you've had you had the 560, and now you got the the 1050. What what are your thoughts on that that type of cooker? Well, I am amazed with the capabilities of that. The the cooking, the charcoal fire on that uh, system is really nice. It gives you the ability. Uh, the first two videos I did using the 1050, uh, the first video I did was smoked beef jerky down around 160 or 170 degrees Fahrenheit to show you how you can do that on that smoker. And the next video I did was at the opposite end of that spectrum. I took a tomahawk ribeye and did a reverse sear where I smoked it at 250 until I got up near temperature and then I cranked the uh, the uh, 1050 up to 600, 700 degrees to finish it off with a sear. It's got a lot of versatility, a whole lot of versatility for a automated charcoal grill. And uh, you're right, it is a new concept. The gravity feed system is not a new concept, but what, what makes this unique in the markets that it's computer controlled and it is a grill and a smoker, and it can do everything in between. The existing gravity feed smokers that are out there now are smokers. They're not grills. They're not designed to run at high temperatures. They're all designed to do your low and slow smoking, and they're all super expensive, even the small ones. A uh, 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 usable size, one of those, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they started around two grand. The uh, master built 560 rolls in at four ninety nine and the ten fifty rolls in at seven ninety nine. Yeah, and that's cheap even for a pellet grill that's not, you know, the the, the non Wi Fi or Bluetooth based pellet grills are that price. So to exactly. have some something that you can actually monitor, not to say that it's a, a you know a top of the line, but for what it can do and what it does for that price range, I mean that's that's getting you know super um, super popular right now, and a lot of people are getting them that have been holding off on pellet grills because pellet grills get that bad rep of not having a good smoke profile or what have you, um, you know. So people are looking at this as, hey, I got I got the same type of convenience of a pellet grill with the you know uh, ability to kind of set it and forget it kind of and monitor it with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but I can get that real charcoal and wood flavor that I can't get from a pellet grill. Exactly, the pellet grill, uh, I like the, the flavor profile I get from the Gravity Series a lot better than from my pellet grill. The pellet grill's got some advantages, um, and the main advantage that the pellet grill has over the gravity series is it's much more fuel efficient. The, uh, the gravity series is a fuel hog. It runs through a lot of charcoal. Uh, I've done a couple of tests on the 1050 and I didn't do this test with the 560 when I had it, but um, I ran the 1050 for I think seven and a half hours at 250 degrees on a full chamber of charcoal, which I don't know how much of that is. I really should have a whole chamber of charcoal doesn't tell you much, but it's a full load of charcoal on that grill. So running at 250, you would need to reload the charcoal after about seven and a half hours. It's not completely out at that point, but you don't want to let this grill go completely out before you reload the coal or you have to relight it. The uh, cook, I cooked a brisket on it at 300 degrees and uh, 
I did a video on that. And I'm trying to remember. I think I had, I think I reloaded charcoal on that one at about the four or four and a half hour mark. It wasn't completely empty, but it was a good, a good point to uh, load when I did it in the video, but it's, uh, it needed to be reloaded. And, uh, but, the flavor profile you get from that grill, like I said, is fantastic. And I'm not a person who really gives a crap about uh, how much my charcoal is costing. Charcoal cost is part of the cost of doing business with a grill. And I never let uh, the cost of charcoal determine whether or not I like a grill or whether or not I'm going to cook on it. It's all about the, uh, the flavor and the quality of the end product. Yeah, I don't think that a hopper can hold a whole bag of charcoal, so I don't think it holds 20 pounds, right? No, it won't hold 20 pounds. I'm, I'm not even sure if I can get 10 pounds in it. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to yeah. measure it. I've, I've never weighed out what it'll hold because once I dump it in there, I'd have to reach down in there from the top to get it all back out. It's, <laughs> it's designed not to really come back out once you put it in there. But another thing with the gravity – is you can run briquettes in it. You can, if you want to cook with Kingsford briquettes, you can do that as well. But I don't know if you get any better efficiency or any better uh, BTU per pound of charcoal with with Kingsford in that grill or not. Yeah, I think you know pellets do cost a lot too. So I mean, I, I bet you if you put a test to it, you know, and that might be something you want to do in a video because you have a pellet grill and you have the that you can kind of see you know, cook something similar for the similar amount of time and see how much you go through of each, um, you know, fuel source because, you know, pellets can, they, you know, I, I have a, you know, camp chef pellet grill and that thing can eat some pellets, you know, if I'm doing a long cook, um, you know, so and pellets aren't cheap either. So, I mean, you're paying 12 bucks to 15 bucks for a bag, a 20 pound bag. Sometimes you can get the cheaper ones, of course, you know, like the pit boss ones for a little bit cheaper, but you're still paying, you know, good 12 bucks a bag for 20 pound bag of pellets. And, you know, if you're doing a longer cook, a pork butt or a brisket, you can use almost a whole bag of pellets on that. So, but like you uh, said, my, my pellet grill is a little more efficient, I think. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I, a 20 pound bag of pellets uh, going through my grill will run way longer than 20 pounds of charcoal in the, uh, in the master built. I've not, uh, I've not timed that out either, but I just know based on how infrequently I reload the pellet hopper on my, on my Traeger there. But anyway, it's a great, you know, I just love the way, you know, grills and outdoor cooking is, is innovating still. I mean, there's still new cookers coming out and every time you turn around, you go, well, they can't, you know, think anything else they do. Somebody comes out with something new uh, or they put a, a spin on the, and uh, they make things better. So, we're going to take a quick break. And one of the things we're going to talk about when we come back is some of the never ending controversial barbecue topics or okay. myths or whatever you want to talk about. We're going to run through a list and then uh, we're going to kind of discuss these, but um, we're going to talk about, you know, more smokers and stuff down the line. I'm sure as more stuff keeps coming out, um, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to end. You got new controllers, new uh, smokers, new, um, you know, things in the uh, barbecue and outdoor cooking industry just it's, continues to blow my mind. So I'll be right back with John Setzler from Man Cave Meals. All right, John, let's get into the, what we came here for now. I want to get into some of these. I think he's been around for a long time, way before any of these cookers that we've been talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, some of it's tradition, some of it's, you know, what people learn from their, their dad or what they've, you know, uh, been doing most of their life. You got uh, all these different um, barbecue sayings or techniques or myths or controversial things that people bring up that you have to do it this way or that way. I want to kind of discuss some of the stuff and uh, go through a list here and just me and you talking, you know, we both, you know, got plenty of barbecue experience and we know a lot of people that have, do the same thing. And I've discussed this with several other people that, um, you know, uh, Malcolm Reed or Meat, Meathead Goldwyn and discuss some of these things. So, we all have our ideas and, and different things that we like to do. And, um, but let's talk about the first thing I want to talk about is 
meat needs to be at room temperature before cooking. That's an old wives tale and myth that's been around for a long time. What's your idea on meat needs to be at room temp? Well, I definitely think it's a myth and I'm, my personal experience is I like to be the exact opposite of that. I like my meat uh, to be cold when I start. And mainly I think that saying uh, is associated with cooking steaks. I think people believe that their steaks cook more evenly and uh, come out better when they're at room temperature. But one of the other things that I don't really understand, I've never tried bringing a steak to room temperature, but, uh, if you take an inch thick or an inch and a half thick steak out of the refrigerator that's been in there for a few days, it'll probably take it eight hours to come to room temperature. And I don't think I'm going to leave my meat sitting out on the counter that long. The uh, I like searing cold meat, so it works better. And uh, I honestly don't know where that started. I don't know where that myth came from or when it started or who started it. But uh, yeah, I hear it pretty regularly. I hear people talking about it and I just kind of blow it off. I've, I've, uh, I've stopped trying to argue that one. <laughs> I, I always look at some of these things and try to put a scientific or common sense value to it. And that's why I like amazingribs.com so much because Meathead does a lot of that with Dr. Blonder and, you know, puts the science to it. And, you know, why in the world would you want your meat sitting out in the uh, danger zone for a longer period of time when it's not going to, do anything to improve how it's cooking. Um, I mean, especially like with a brisket or a pork butt, you know, you want it to be cold when you put it on the smoker because it'll give you, uh, you know, more smoke adhering to, to the surface. I mean, because, you know, meat loves, you know, or smoke loves cold, wet surfaces. And then if you put it on there at room temperature, you, you know, you lose some of that benefit, so. Exactly. The, the searing of the cold, I like to sear the cold steak. Um, and you coming from a sous vide uh, standpoint would understand that better than most people because if my steak's colder, I'm going to be able to get a better quality sear on the outside of that meat before I go to the low temperature side of my cook where I've got less of that gray band that everybody wants to talk about. I, as you know, I don't do a whole lot of reverse sear. I, I'm I'm in the sear first crowd, but when I when I sear that meat when it's cold, that sear uh, doesn't uh, cook the meat under the surface as quickly when the meat's cold as it might if if it's 50 degrees warmer at room temperature. Yeah, that uh, overcooking, uh, you know, the chance of overcooking it when <laughs> the warmer it is, the the more of a chance you have it to uh, you know surpass the temperature you want to finish it at. That is for sure. So let's go to another big one. Looking ain't cooking. I mean, you still hear this. I still hear barbecue gurus, you know, self-proclaimed barbecue gurus say this um, on their videos and books, you know, looking ain't cooking. Well, I know where that one came from and uh, it, it held true uh, in my early days of barbecue, especially when I was cooking on the Weber kettle. Uh, the, the reason they say that is every time you open, like if you're smoking a butt or a, even a rack of ribs or something on a kettle, uh, when you take that lid off, you lose all of your ambient heat. And when you put that lid back on, it takes it a while to bring that thing back up to the temperature you were before you put the, uh, before you put the, uh, or before you took the lid off. And uh, the, if you're, looking you're not cooking statement is actually the underlying reason I ended up with a Kamado grill. It's because I was trying to cook a pizza on my Weber kettle and it was cold and windy that day and I couldn't get the pizza to cook adequately and I ended up having to bring it in, cook it in the oven. So yeah, there's a little bit of merit to the if you're looking you ain't cooking, but that all depends on what kind of grill you're cooking on. If you've got a Kamado grill, you don't have that problem. Uh, if you've got any other kind of grill that's got enough thermal mass that when you open it and close the lid, it comes back to temperature fairly quickly, it's not a problem. But that that still is a problem on uh, things like the the Weber kettle mainly. The Weber Smoky Mountain's not bad about it if you've got water in the water pan, but uh, 
yeah, I know where that one came from. And I agree with it if you're using a Weber kettle. Or even if you're using like, you know, the uh, cheap Home Depot type, you know, offsets because they got very thin metal. Anything that's not well insulated that um, already has a difficult time retaining any kind of heat. I mean, I know even some of the cheaper pellet grills, you know, they sell, you know, big, thick insulated blankets for people up north to use during the colder months so that, you know, they could actually get to a cooking temp because, you know, you could, I guess some of the cheaper pellet grills up north without a, a you know, any kind of insulating blanket on it, it, you know, it's hard for it to even get past 250 if you're trying to cook anything. So, um, but yeah, I can understand that as well. But if you got a, a decent cooker that's well insulated or, you know, uh, you know, a thicker you know, smoker, you know, it's got thicker metal, definitely, you know, it's going to hold the heat in it and you don't have to worry about that. Fat cap up or fat cap down? I don't know why this always comes up. <laughs> well, it does come up and it's, uh, I see it every time the new guy gets his first butter brisket out for the grill. I'm a fat cap down guy. This, this isn't really a myth. It's a preference. Uh, but I think it's prefer. I think everybody's uh, justification for whatever they do is all wrong. <laughs> so uh, I, I cook fat cap down, and the reason I cook fat cap down is well, there's two reasons. Number one, I know I'm not going to get any bark to form on the fat cap. It's just not going to happen. Uh, the second reason I like it down is because it makes it easier for me to get the meat off the grill. I, I would rather have my presentation side of the meat uh, not down on the grill when we're talking about a butt or a brisket, or really if you even have a presentation side. But the uh, if I cook fat cap up, that fat is going to render, and it's going to run down all over the meat, and it's going to inhibit the bark from forming on the sides and on the bottom of my meat where I want the bark to form. So... That's the reason I cook fat cap down. And the myth that people buy into on that, I think, is that self, they think it's a self-basting concept, which it is. It's self-basting, but that, uh, that fat's not finding its way into the meat. In fact, the exact opposite's happening. The fat that's inside the meat's working its way out as you heat it up. There's nothing you can do to put, put additional fat or moisture into that meat. So... The people that cook fat cap up for that reason, uh, you know, they can do whatever whatever they like. But yeah, it's not it's not serving the purpose they think it's serving. Yeah, and most of the time, I I understand people will try to say, well, it depends on where the the heat's coming from, you know, because if you have it on a uh, uh, stick burner and the, the the heat's coming from the side like more on the on the top you know you want that fat cap to protect it from burning or what have you or if it's coming from the bottom like from a kamado you might want to have the fat cap you know protecting it one of the things i do since i, I mix sous vide and barbecue is i remove most of the fat cap from the briskets and pork butts that i do because I don't need them to be cook that long to have the fat cap on there to protect the meat. So, um, you know, I, I remove most of the fat cap and don't have even have to worry about that problem because most of the time, anyway, you're not eating that big clumps of fat. Anyway, you're throwing it out. You're not going to, you know, or you're letting it render and mix in with, uh, you know, getting you know chunky and, and black and mixing it in. But, um, you know, uh, I take a lot of the fat cap off both the brisket and, and pork butt. So, but yeah, that one's always, you know, people will always put their two cents in. You always, whenever there's a fat cap up, fat cap down, people troll those posts. Just, they make them just to get people going. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, there's one thing I'm going to try that I haven't tried yet on a butt. I, I think the next time, if I remember, I've been saying I'm going to do this and I never remember to do it when I cook, but I'm going to cook my next Boston butt on its side. And, uh, where the fat cap is either going to be on the right or the left. And I'm doing that for a different reason. It's got nothing to do with the fat cap. When I'm cooking a Boston butt, the last piece of that Boston butt to become probe tender is the part that's 
directly above the scapula bone in there, the part that's shielded from the heat underneath. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out that if I turn that butt the other way, where that bone is running vertical in there instead of horizontal, if it'll change the way that cooks. But once again, that's got nothing to do with the fat cap or fat cap <laughs> up or down debate. All right. Maybe, maybe we'll start a new trend. There you go. That's that, <laughs> so next time you see that, you know, in one of the Facebook groups, you say sideways and see what happens. Right. <laughs> All right. The need to smoke, you need to smoke, you know, soak your wood before you put it in the smoker. I see this still today that people will soak their wood and, and it's more people with wood chips, I guess, because they think that it's going to last longer. Well, yeah, they think it's going to last longer. Uh, it brings back a memory. When I was younger, my dad decided he was going to smoke. He wanted to make some smoked turkey at home. And he went out and bought one of these. Uh, it's a small bullet style smoker that had an electric heating element in the bottom of it. You put wood chips in it. And uh, he told me, he said, you have to soak these wood chips to keep them from burning up. And uh, that may may have been the case. But I've played around early in my career of, of smoking. I soaked wood chunks. I've, I've honestly not got a whole lot of experience with wood chips. I've used them on occasion, but I've soaked chunks and that I can't really tell that they don't burn up any faster. I am, uh, once again, a firm believer of about everything Meathead Goldwyn says. And uh, he talks about that in his book and on his website in detail. Those You can soak a wood chunk for, I don't know, what did he do? Soak them for 24 hours, and he got, what, two millimeters of water penetration into that chunk. It's really insignificant because the water that it does take on it evaporates back out so quickly that it's really having no impact on, on the wood. And you really want smoke. I mean, that's the whole point of having wood in there is you want smoke. So all you're really doing when you do that is you're preventing it from smoking because it's steaming all that water out. And then when it does start smoking, it's going to burn no matter what. So I don't think it burns any less if you soak it. I, I got to confess, you know, when I first started barbecuing, that was, I heard that and I, I did it on a couple of them. And then I started going, wait a minute, it's not really, you know, doing anything. It's not slowing it down. And I see all this white stuff coming out. And I, then I started researching and go, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me either. So I stopped doing it. But, you know, people will still, I don't know, it's one of those things that survives time, I guess. People will still, um, you know, do it. And I, like I said, I see it more on chips and people using it on a gas grill with like one of those little one of those little smoker boxes thinking that it's going to last longer but steam's not smoke and that's one of the things i agree 100 percent with uh, me head on is they see steam coming out think it's smoke but it doesn't have any you know it's not smoking it's just steam all right bigger smoke ring means more flavor we all see that oh look at this big smoke ring i got on this brisket yeah smoke rings are Smoke rings are the uh, badges of honor of the barbecue chef. And, uh, yeah, the smoke ring, it's whether or not the smoke ring, the smoke ring is a flavor element, but the flavor, this, there's a whole bunch of science behind smoke rings, and I've read most of it. I've learned about it firsthand from Harry Sue. I've read about it from Meathead. But uh, I don't think it's a real player in the game of flavor. Uh, that I've done curing. I've done a lot of cured meat as well. And because of that, I have a little different understanding of that smoke ring. That smoke ring is the beginning of that meat curing. It's the nitrates that are uh, produced by the combustion that are causing that meat to change color around the outside of it just like a brisket changes to that color completely when you cure it in a brine that's got pink curing salt in it. The difference between the two is it's in the curing brine long enough for that smoke ring or that nitrate ring to 
to go all the way to the center of the meat rather than just be on the outside edge. But that's just it. It's not smoke that's uh, creating that. It's a byproduct of combustion. And smoke is a byproduct of combustion, but it's a particulate byproduct. And the nitrates are a gaseous byproduct. So there you have it. That's the little bit of science I know about the smoke and the smoke. Uh yeah, now it does look pretty. There's no doubt about it. People look at that and go, yeah, that, that, but as far as flavor or taste or anything that is going to make that brisket taste any better or um, uh, anything else, it's just, it's more cosmetic than anything. It's people have that in their mind that it, it should be better because it's got that bigger smoke ring. Uh, all right. Smoke penetrates deep into the meat. And this is a big one that, um, uh, I know that meathead's really big on too, and I understand how smoke works, and I know you do as well. And one of the things that we've talked about before is using smoke as a seasoning, and this kind of falls into that because we know that you know smoke can't penetrate deep into a meat, just like you know marinades don't penetrate deep into the meat. You know, there's got to be a chemical reaction that actually, uh, that like that what salt does when you're you know brining or curing. Uh, so what's your thoughts on that? Well, I may be wrong, but here's what I believe. Smoke itself doesn't penetrate into the meat at all. It all accumulates on the surface. But what accumulates on the surface could be interacting with the moisture on the surface, and some of it could be pulled in slightly. Uh, but it's not going in with any depth. And... Uh, yeah, it's a surface seasoning. It's like it's like your garlic powder or anything else. It will accumulate on the surface of your meat, and it accumulates the most on the surface of your meat while the surface of your meat's wet. Yeah, and it doesn't have to, and that's one of the things, you know, I get an argument with people that, you know, they think it, it has to in order for it to be, you know, good and it's just like you season a steak you know you know when you put seasoning on a steak it's not going all the way deep into the steak it's being on the surface is plenty it's going to you know when you take a bite of it and chew it up it's all going to mush together and you're going to get that flavor throughout whatever you're eating um, just like with pulled pork you pull pork you're pulling it all apart and you're mixing the smoke flavor all into that pork so you're going to get that flavor throughout so um yeah, it doesn't penetrate, but it doesn't need to. It's going to season your meat no matter what. Um, meat takes on or it won't will stop taking on smoke after a certain temperature. Uh, well, there there is some truth to that, but technically it's incorrect. Like I said, smoke is a particulate. It's it's very tiny particles uh, that are carbon you know, carbon-based, and those particles can land on your food at any given time. And like I said before, the smoke sticks to your food more when it's wet. So when you're looking at something like a brisket, uh, a Boston butt, or ribs, if you've ever watched one of those things cook, if you've been peaking instead of cooking, so you, you, know, you open that lid periodically and have a look at what's going on, during the first part of that cook, the outside of that meat stays moist. There's a lot of uh, moisture coming to the surface of that meat. It stays wet. And it's collecting a lot more smoke. Later on in the cook, once that bark begins to form and solidify, the outside of your meat looks like it's dry. And it is drier. It's not losing as much moisture. And it's what is coming out. It's coming out at a faster rate once you get to that point. But I can't sit here and say that the meat stops taking on smoke. It's gonna, there's the potential for smoke to uh, be added to that meat the entire time it's being exposed to it. But I do agree that it's taking on more smoke earlier in the cook. And uh, depending on what you're cooking, you know, we might not be talking about meat. What if we've got a pan of my lasagna and there are a pan of macaroni and cheese? That stuff is like a smoke sponge, and it'll take on smoke for as long as you are putting smoke to it. And you can ask my wife because <laughs> uh, she lets me know. My wife has got a much more acute taste for smoke than I do, 
obviously, because I'm around it more, but she'll let me know right away that something's too smoky or something tastes like an ashtray. Yeah, I, even though I've been doing this a long time, I hear it occasionally. Well, and you can over smoke things. And I know, especially poultry and especially with skin on poultry, because yep. that, that skin on, on chicken and turkey will suck up smoke because it's not, you know, the same protein as the, you know, the, the muscles. I mean, skin will suck it up and I've over smoked turkey and I've over smoked chicken before. And I can tell you, you know, it, it can taste like an ashtray if you use the wrong smoke or too much smoke. Um, or you have it on there, you know, just too long, but, um, yeah, that's another thing. Different things can take more smoke, but yeah, you're right. The, you know, you can take, since it is a surface treatment and moisture, you know, will, uh, you know, put more smoke to your meat. I, I always say that's why I spritz. And that's one of the things too, I want to talk about is spritzing. People always think that, you know, they see these, uh, uh, you know, professional barbecue guys spritzing their meat after a while it's not putting moisture into the meat. It's not making the, the meat more moist after it's done. It's actually putting that moisture back on the surface to collect more smoke so that it can dry and have another, like a layer of paint. It's what I kind of call it, like smoke paint. You know, once it's dry and it's, you can tell that the bark's starting to form, you put another, you spritz it with some moisture, whatever it is, apple juice, water, whatever you want to use, it's going to, collect more smoke and dry and do the same thing just like a layer of paint if you're painting a wall so, so spritzing uh i think i understand that and the when i went to harry sue's barbecue school at his home it's 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 basically uh teaching you competition style barbecue and harry teaches you how to make a smoke ring and spritzing is part of that process uh Harry tells you right up front, just like everybody else does, you're not being judged on your smoke ring. But he also says that uh, he's never seen any barbecue that didn't have a smoke ring win a prize. So the he teaches you in his class the spritzing, but you don't start spritzing until the bark starts to form on the meat, which is all happening around the time your meat gets to the internal temperature of 155, 155 to 160 is when your bark starts forming. This is also when your stall starts. And uh, the, uh, according to Harry, and I have to agree with him because I've tried this and found it to be very successful at forming a smoke ring is once that bark starts forming, you spritz that meat every 15 or 20 minutes until the bark is set and every time i've done that i've had a beautiful smoke ring no matter what i was cooking or no matter how i was cooking it so but yeah that's what you're doing with the spritz the spritz is not uh adding any moisture to the meat there's nothing you can do during a cook to add moisture to your meat you can inject your meat beforehand uh but those are also, that's a flavor addition. That's not going to end up as a moisture addition. So let's talk about that since you just mentioned the uh, stall and the, you know, the meat stall happens on, you know, pork butt and, and brisket and um, some other things, but mostly on those two, you'll see it where it's humming along the temperature, internal temperatures climbing and it hits that 155 to 160 and it just kind of stops. And sometimes it can last a couple hours. And a lot of people will think that it, that's when the fat starts to render and the connective tissue starts melting is what causes that. But I know that, you know, you're like me, you read a lot of uh, amazing ribs and, and meathead and, you know, Dr. Blounder found it was evaporative cooling. And like you said, it's, you know, when you're initially getting up to that temperature, you're seeing the moisture on the meat more because it's coming out of the meat. And right at that 155 to 160 ish, you know, can be, you know, five or 10 degrees either way. That's when it starts to kind of balance out. And that's what this evaporative cooling kind of hits. And that's what causes the stall, right? Exactly. Uh, the evaporative cooling, the best way to describe that where people can really understand what that means. It's like when you get out of the shower 
when you step out of that warm shower into a cooler room, you get cold very quickly. Your skin gets cold. It's because that water is evaporating off your skin and you get really chilled. That's exactly what's happening to a brisket or a butt when it gets to that temperature range. Uh, the, the evaporation on the surface of the meat is happening at a rate that's equal to the heat coming into the meat and the temperature stalls. It'll stay at that same temperature for a long time if you're cooking in certain ranges. Uh, that's exactly what the stall is. Uh, I hate stalls. I hate dealing with stalls. And I've gotten to the point where I hate dealing with long cooks. And uh, I've, I've changed my philosophy of cooking so I don't have to deal with that anymore. If I do have to deal with it, it's because I chose to cook something overnight and intentionally cooked it at a lower temperature. I get rid of the stalls by cooking at 300 degrees. I'm technically not getting rid of the stalls, but they are not nearly as noticeable when you're cooking at three or 325 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of the, you know, the hot and fast, you know, briskets and pork, but that they're doing a lot on the competition circuit now, you know, too. They're not just doing them, you know, uh, in the backyards. People are actually winning competitions, cooking hot and fast, and it does it. It gets rid of that stall or slows it, you know, gets it shortens the, the stall period. If you're not cooking at 225 or, you know, 250, and you're, you're cooking a little bit hotter, the, the hotter you cook it, the less you know, impact that stall has. So I always tell people, you know, 225 is, you, you don't have to cook it at that. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest benefit of, of the higher temperatures is you have a lot more predictability of when that meat's going to be ready as well. 225 uh, is, that's another uh, holy, we call it a holy grail temperature mm -hmm. for low and slow. Uh, everybody thinks they're not cooking low and slow unless they're cooking at 225. I consider 300 degrees to be low and slow, and I can't tell any difference in my final product if I cooked it at 225 or if I cooked it at 300. Actually, I can. I, I've lied a little bit there. A bark, if you're not wrapping, a bark will get a lot firmer and a lot harder if you're cooking at 225, oddly enough, than it does if you're cooking at 300. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a preference that I've learned that I really love. Yeah, and me too. I mean, I, I, I've, one of the things that I like about mixing sous vide and barbecue is you don't have the stall. You're actually, I'm putting the meat on at the same temperature that it would have stalled at anyway. So a lot of times, and like I've done this with poultry, where I'll, instead of chilling the meat before putting it in the smoker, I'll put it directly on the smoker right out of the sous vide bath. And if let's say I was cooking it at 148 and I put it on the smoker, which is at 275 to three, well, let's just say 350 from doing a chicken because I want the skin to get crispy. It'll actually sit there at that temperature I sous vide it at for a good 25 to 30 minutes before it even starts rising internally. So it, it has that, you know, evaporative type cooling situation going on because it's sitting already at a high, hotter temperature. So it, it takes it a while for it to even start climbing after you put it on a hot smoker. So, but that's definitely, um, you know, yeah, it, there's definitely ways around the stall and uh, the stall is really from evaporative cooling. So let's, let's get into just like one or two more and then I'll let you go and cook dinner for your wife. Beer can chicken is the best. <laughs> well, that's another one of those things. Uh, I've done it. I've made some good chicken, but uh, I don't think the chicken was good because I cooked it on a beer can that had anything in it. But let me say this about that. And this also applies to a lot of these things we've talked about today. These are some of the things that make people feel good about what they're cooking. So I, I don't really want to, you know, strip people of their, uh, what a, what a sword I'm looking for here of their methods that make them happy about doing what they do. I'm, I'm not a fan of beer can chicken. I've done it a couple times. Uh, the chicken's good, uh, but I understand what it's really not doing. People think it's infusing the flavor of the beer into their, or whatever liquid they choose into their chicken. And it's not, it's just basically causing the inside of the bird to steam rather than cook normally. But, 
everybody has their methods that they like, uh, and beer can chicken's one of them. I see that that particular thing. I see that a lot more out and around in the neighborhood. If I see somebody cooking on a grill, I'll see that beer can chicken thing going on. It's something they love to do, and it's something uh, they're proud of, and they want to. Uh, that's their gig. You know, that's that's what they do that makes their chicken better than the next guy's chicken or something. It's just like the fat cap up, you know, uh, people believe as long as somebody believes their results better because of the way they're doing it, that's great. They need to keep doing it that way. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and they sell these things to make it easier for them to do it. That's the thing. I think people will go to the Walmart and buy this $10, you know, rack or what have you. And, you know, and even Kamada Joe's got theirs, you know, where you can pour the liquid in it. <laughs> There's a little ceramic thing. So, yeah, it's, and, and like you said, you know, people are going to do it no matter what you say. And they're going to, you know, that's their thing. And, and I, I'm 100% for people cooking the way they want to, using, you know, whatever, you know, cooking their meat the way they want to, the doneness level, the seasoning, um, 100%. But when they start fighting about this stuff is what kind of, gets me is when they you have to do beer can chicken that is the best you know and i can tell you right now me and you can cook chickens 10 different ways and it'd be better than anybody else's beer can chicken so yeah it's you know I, i'm all for people cooking the way they want to but don't sit there and tell me this is the only way you can do it and that's going to be better than any other cooking method um, last one we'll talk about and then i'll let you go is searing locks and juices i think I don't, that one's been around for a long time and people think that, um, I don't know why people think that searing will lock in juices, but I think it started back when people were just strictly cooking in the kitchen, I think with like roasts and, and stuff like that. Well, I know why it's popular. Uh, it's just like politics. One of the things I like to keep in the back of my mind about politics and about religion and about cooking those are the three big things, right? Okay. <laughs> Here's the deal. If somebody says something enough, if you hear something enough times, you will believe it, whether it's true, false, or otherwise. And, you know, I still hear the uh, searing locks in the juices. You know, I can turn on Food Network or some cooking channel, and you'll hear that. And you know, I, I know it's been debunked. I don't know how many times, but the, the where I hear that one the most often is when people are preparing their uh, their pot roast. That's going to go there at that chuck that's going to go in a crock pot for eight hours with all that other lovely goodness. They want to they're they're going to steer that chuck roast because it's going to lock in the juices. But what they're really doing is searing it. It ain't locking any juices in, but it's putting one heck of a nice flavor on the outside of that piece of chuck roast. And that's what's happening there. Yeah, it, I, I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to convince people of that. I've gotten to the point where I'm trying. I haven't completely learned how to do this yet is to scroll on by that comment. and <laughs> just not <laughs> Uh, it, you're, it, 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 it's hard for me. I try with all my might sometimes, and I still will let myself get into an argument about something like that. And I'm getting better about it, but yeah, uh, I'm yeah, it doesn't lock anything in, but it does serve another purpose. So, that's one another thing I want to talk about that I didn't have listed, but it's you know, it's the same subject. And going back to uh, Harry Sue and the, and the you know competition barbecue people not winning if they don't have a decent smoke ring, it's um, you know steaks with the grill marks because on the steak cook-off circuit you won't see. And I've, I've talked to you know one of the president of the steak cook-off association, you know, he said that he doesn't see many, if all, you know, steaks winning the cook-offs that don't have the grill grate grill marks on them. Well, that's because the, the way their rules are written, that's very fortunate for the grill grate company uh, because they're the only product that makes the marks that nicely. The uh, part of the uh, judging 
of the steak cook-off is the appearance of the meat. And, uh, you know, it's just pretty well accepted. You've got to have that. And I like the looks of grill marks. I think grill marks look great on camera. They make that steak on the menu at the Outback look nice. But uh, you've seen me cook steaks. And how many times have you seen me cook steaks where I didn't sear on a flat surface? Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, the Maillard reaction, you want it all over your meat because like you said, just like with the whole reason you're searing, it's not to lock in juices, is to create flavor on the whole surface of that, that piece of meat. And that's what you get on a flat surface. And yep. I've got grill grates and I use them and the it creates a different flavor because what I'm getting out of that grill grate is not a Maillard reaction. I'm getting char and I'm hoping to get my yard reaction in between those char marks, but char is a flavor as well. And it's a flavor a lot of people like, and a little bit of char like that on the outside of a steak is good. I really like, I do prefer cooking pork chops like that. And I, I cook my thick pork chops that way after I marinate them. But the, uh, there's a difference between the char flavor and the uh, Maillard sear and the combination of the two is good, but I prefer, you know, that nice Maillard sear without the char on a steak, but that's just me. That's just how I like mine. Yeah, and that's the good thing about the grill grates. You can flip them over and get that flat surface. So that's what I normally do with them. <laughs> Occasionally I'll cook them on the grill grate side just uh, for show. You know, if I'm having guests over and, you know, I think I want to, they'll, they'll, they'll go ooh and ah if they, they see those, you know, big thick grill marks on there. Or if I'm doing a video and I want to show it off. But most of the time, if I'm cooking for myself or my family, I'll flip those grill grates over and just cook on the flat surface. Or I'll cook on a, on a cast iron uh, griddle or on the uh, soapstone on the Kamado Joe. So. Absolutely. The soapstone's my favorite flat surface to cook on. And I absolutely love that thing. And I can't get enough of that. That's my favorite, favorite cooking surface for searing. Yeah. I just did some uh, top rounds on them the other day, actually, that I sous vide first and I seared them because, um, you know, the bigger ones, I got, you know, two big top rounds and got a nice overall surface on both sides or sear on both sides of them is awesome. All right, John. Well, I think we covered enough of those for today, and I want to let you get back to doing what you were doing today. I want to thank you for being on. Is there anything else you wanted to discuss or talk about? Anything new coming out with the uh, Atlanta Grill Company or Kamado Joe? Or uh, There's a couple of new things coming around. Uh, it's a little too early for me to mention some of this stuff just yet, but I will let you know as soon as I can. I'm cooking dinner for Tanya tonight. I'm cooking experimental food. And if it's successful, you're going to see a video next week. I am, uh, I'm doing a macaroni and cheese like I've never done it before tonight. And if, if my wife likes it, it's going to become a cooking video next week. So keep your eyes open for that. All right. Well, we look forward to that. Make sure you follow John on Man Cave Meals on Facebook and YouTube. You can also check out the uh, Kamado Joe uh, of them on there for the many years he represented uh, Kamado Joe but uh, make sure you check out Man Cave Meals on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube thanks again John, we will see you again on the next one I'm sure thanks Darren, I'm looking forward to it alrighty, take care well, thanks for listening today folks, I want to thank John Setzler of Man Cave Meals for being on again make sure you check out the Man Cave Meals Facebook page, YouTube channel also, make sure you follow us on Facebook under the Fire and Water Cooking Facebook page group. Also, check out the Fire and Water Cooking YouTube channel as well. And make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Fire and Water Cooking podcast. Thanks again.